was a bitter night, so we drew on our ulsters and wrapped cravats about our throats. Outside, the stars were shining coldly in a cloudless sky, and the breath of the passers-by blew out into smoke like so many pistol shots. Our footfalls rang out crisply and loudly as we swung through the doctor's quarter, Wimpole Street, Hardy Street, and so through Wigmore Street into Oxford Street. In a quarter of an hour, we were in Bloomsbury at the Alpha Inn, which is a small public house at the corner of one of those streets we'd run down into Holborn. Holmes pushed open the door of the private bar and ordered two glasses of beer from the ruddy-faced, white-aproned landlord. Your beer should be excellent if it is as good as your geese. My geese? said the man, surprised. Yes, I was speaking only half an hour ago to Mr Henry Baker, who was a member of your goose club. Oh, yes, I see. You see, see the nymph's not our geese. Indeed. Who's that? Well, I got two dozen from a salesman in Common Garden. Indeed. I know some of them. Which one was it? Beckinridge is his name. Ah, I uh, don't know him. Well, here's to your good health, landlord, and prosperity to your house. Good night. Now, for Mr Breckenbridge. He continued buttoning up his coat as we came out into the frosty air. Remember, Watson, that although we have so homely a thing as a goose at one end of this chain, we have at the other a man who will certainly gets seven years penal servitude unless we can establish his innocence. Yes. It is possible that our inquiry may but confirm his guilt, but in any case we have a line of investigation which has been missed by the police and which a singular chance has placed in our hands. Let us follow it to the bitter end. Faces to the south, then, and quick march. We passed across Holborn, down Endell Street, and so through a zigzag of slums to Covent Garden Market. One of the largest stalls bore the, bore the name of Breckenridge upon it, and the proprietor, a horsey-looking man with a sharp face and trim side whiskers, was helping a boy to put up the shutters. Good evening, Scott, tonight, said Holmes. The salesman nodded and shot a questioning glance at my companion. Sold out of geese, I see. Continued Holmes, pointing at the bare slabs of marble. I let you have 500 tomorrow morning. That's no good. Well, there's some on the stall with the gas flare. Ah, but I was re recommended by you. By who? The landlord of the Alpha. Oh, yes, yeah, I sent him a couple of dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, where did you get them from? To my surprise, the question provoked a burst of anger from the salesman. Now then, mister, said he, with his head cocked and his arms akimbo. What are you driving at? Let's have it straight now. Well, it is straight enough. I should like to know who sold you the geese which you supplied to the Alpha. Well, I shan't tell you so now. Oh. It's a matter of no importance, but uh, I don't know why you should be so warm over such a trifle. Warm? You'd be warm maybe if you weren't a pest as I am. When I pay good money for a good article, there should be an end to the business. But they said, where are these keys and who did you sell them to and, and where would you um, who would take what would you take with the keys and all? One would think that the only geese in the world to hear the fuss that is made over them. Well, I have no connection with any other people who have been making inquiries. If you won't tell us, the bet's off, that's all. But I'm always ready to back my opinion on the matter of fowls. And I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is country bred. Well, then, you lost your fiver for it's town bred, snapped the salesman. It's nothing of the kind. I say it is. I don't believe it. Do you think you know more about fowls than I? We've hound on them ever since I was a nipper. I told you, those birds that went the alpha were time bred. You'll never persuade me to believe it, I'm afraid. Oh, will you bet then? Well, I'm merely taking your money, for I know I'm right. But I'll have a sovereign with you just to teach you not to be obstinate. The salesman chuckled grimly. <laughs> Bring me the books, Bill, said he. The small boy brought round a small, thin volume and a great greasy-backed one, laying them out together beneath the hanging lamp. Now then, Mr Cockshaw, said the salesman, I thought I was out of geese, but before I finish, you'll find that there is still one left in the shop. See this little book? Well? That's a list of the folk from whom I buy. Do you see? Well, then here, here on this page, are the country folk. I see this other page in red ink. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the list of my town suppliers. Now, look at that third name. Just read it out to me. Uh, Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, 249. Red Holmes. Quite so. Now, turn up, turn that up in the ledger. Holmes turned the page indicated. Here you are, Mrs. Oakshot, 117 Brixton Road, egg and poultry supplier. Now, then, what's the last entry? December 22nd. 24 geese at seven shillings, six pence. Quite so. There you are. And underneath? Sold to Mr. Windigate of the Alpha at 12 shillings. What have you to say now? Huh? Hmm. Sherlock Holmes looked deeply chagrined. 
he drew a sovereign from his pocket and threw it down upon the slab, turning away with the air of a man whose disgust is too deep for words. Ah. A few yards off, he stopped under a lamppost and laughed in that hearty, noiseless fashion which was so peculiar of him. I dare say if I put a hundred pounds down in front of him, that man would not have given me such a complete information as was drawn from him by the idea that he was doing me on a wager. Well, Watson, we are, I fancy, nearing the end of our quest. And the only point which remains is to be determined as whether we should go on to this Mrs. Oakshot tonight or whether should we reserve it for tomorrow. It is clear from what that surly fellow said that there are others besides ourselves who are anxious about the matter, and I should... His remarks were suddenly cut short by a loud hubbub which broke out from the stall which we had just left. Turning round, we saw a little rat-faced fellow at the stall while Breckenridge, the salesman, was shaking his fist fiercely at the cringing figure. I've had enough of you and your geese, he shouted. What have you to do with it? Did I buy these geese off you? No, but one of them was mine all the same, whined the little man. Well, then ask Mrs Oakshot for it. No, she told me to ask you. Well, you can go and ask the King of Prussia for all I care. I've had enough of it. Get out of it. Go on. He rushed fiercely forward, and the acquirer flitted away into the darkness. Ha! This may save us a visit to Brixton Road, whispered Holmes. Come with me, and we'll see what is to be made of this fellow. Striding through the scattered knots of people who lounged round the flaring stalls, my companion speedily overtook the little man and touched him upon the shoulder. Who are you, then? What would you want? He asked in a quavering voice. You will excuse me, but I could not help overhearing the questions with which you put to the salesman just now. I think that I could be of assistance. You? Who are you? How could you know anything of the matter? My name is Sherlock Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. But you can know nothing of this. Excuse me, I know everything of it. You are endeavouring to trace some geese which was sold by Mrs Oakshot of Brixton Road to a salesman named Breckenbridge, by him in turn to Mr Windigate of the Alpha, and by him to his club, of which Mr Henry Baker is a member. Oh, sir, you are the very man who I've longed to meet, mm. cried the little fellow with outstretched hands and quivering fingers. I can hardly explain to you how interested I am in this matter. Mm. Sherlock Holmes hailed a four-wheeler which was passing. In that case, we'd better discuss it in a cosy room rather than this windswept market. Place. said he but pray tell me before we go farther who is it that i have the pleasure of assisting the man hesitated for an instant my name is john robertson he answered with a sidelong glance no no the real name it's always awkward doing business with an alias a flush sprang to the white cheeks of the stranger well then said he my real name is james Ryder. precisely so head attendant at the hotel cosmopolitan Pray step into the cab, and I shall soon be able to tell you everything which you will wish to know. The little man stood glancing from one to the other of us with half-frightened, half-hopeful eyes, as one who is not sure whether he's on the verge of a windfall or a catastrophe. <laughs> then he stepped into the cab, and in half an hour we were back in the sitting room of Baker Street. Nothing had been said during our drive, but the high, thin breathing of our new companion and the claspings and unclaspings of his hands spoke of the nervous tension within him. Here we are. The fire looks very seasonable in this weather. You look cold, Mr. Ryder. Pray, uh, take the basket chair. I will just put on my slippers before we settle this little matter of yours. Now then, you want to know what became of those geese? Yes, sir. Or rather, I fancy, of that goose. It was one bird, I imagine, in which you were interested, white with a black bar across the <gasps> tail. Ryder quivered with emotion. Oh, sir, he cried. Can you tell me where it went to? It came here. Here? Yes, and a most remarkable bird it proved. I don't wonder that you should be interested in it. It laid an egg after it was dead. The bonniest, brightest little blue egg that was ever seen. I have it here in my museum. Our visitor staggered to his feet and clutched the mantelpiece with his right hands. Holmes unlocked his strong box and held up the blue carbuncle, which shone out like a star with a cold, brilliant, many-pointed radiance. Ryder stood glaring with a drawn face, uncertain whether to claim or to disown it. The game's up, Ryder. Hold up, man, or you'll go into the fire. Giving him an arm back to the chair, Watson. <laughs> He's not got blood enough to go in for felony with impunity. Give him a dash of brandy. Yes. So, huh, now he looks a little bit more human. What a shrimp it is, to be sure. For a moment, he had staggered and nearly fallen, but the brandy brought a tinge of colour into his cheeks, and he sat staring with frightened eyes at his accuser. 
I have almost every link in my hands and all the proofs which I could possibly need, so there is little that you need tell me. Still, a little may as well be cleared up to make the case complete. You had heard, Ryder, of this blue stone of the Countess of Morcars? It was Catherine Cusack who told me of it, said he in a crackling voice. I see, the ladyship's waiting maid. Well, the temptation of sudden wealth so easily acquired was too much for you, as it has been for better men before you. But you are not very scrupulous in the means you used. It seems to me, Ryder, that there is the making of a very petty villain in you. You knew this man Horner, the plumber, had been concerned in some such matter, and that suspicion would rest more readily upon him. So what did you do then? You made some small job in the ladies' room, you and your confederate Cusack, and you managed that he should be the man sent for. Then, when he'd left, you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and this unfortunate man was arrested. You then... Ryder threw himself down suddenly upon the rug and clutched my companion's knees. For God's sake, have mercy, he shrieked. Think of my father, of my mother. He'd break their hearts. I never went wrong before. I never will again. I swear, I swear on the Bible. I don't be in the court for Christ's sake, don't. Get back into your chair said Holmes sternly. It was very well to cringe and crawl now, but you thought little enough of this poor Horner in the dock for a crime which he would which he knew nothing. I will fly, Mr. Holmes. I will leave the country, sir. Then the charge against him will break down. Hmm. Well, we'll talk about that. And now let us hear a true account of the next act. How came the stone into the goose? And how came the goose into the open market? Tell the truth, for there lies only the hope of safety. Ryder passed his tongue over his parched lips. I will tell you, just as it happened, sir, said he. When Horner had been arrested, well, it seemed to me that it would be best for me to get away with the stone at once, for I did not know at what moment the police might not take it into their heads to search me in my room. Mm. Well, there was no place at the hotel where it would be safe. I went out as if on some commission. I made up my sister's house. She had married a man named Oatshot and lived in the Brixton Road, where she fattened fowls for the market. All the way there, every man I met seemed to be a policeman or a detective. And for all that, it was cold. The sweat was pouring down my face before I came to Brixton Road. My sister asked what the matter was and, and why I was so pale. But I told her that I'd been upset by the jewel robbery at the hotel. Then I went in the backyard and smoked a pipe and wondered what it would be best to do. I, I have a friend, uh, once called Maudsley, who went to the bad and just had been serving his time in Pentonville. I see. He, he would show me how to turn the stone into money, but how to get him safely. I thought of all the agonies I'd gone through in coming from the hotel. I might, I might at any moment be seized and searched and, and there would be the stone in my waistcoat pocket. I was leaning against the wall at the time and looking at the geese which were waddling around my feet and Suddenly an idea came to my head which showed me how I could be the best detective that ever lived. Huh. My sister told me some weeks before that I might have the pick of her geese for Christmas present. I knew she was always as good as her word. I'd take my goose now and in it I would carry my stone to Kilburn. There, there was a, a, a little shed in the yard and behind this I drove one of the birds, a big fine one, white with a barred tail, I caught it uh, and prying its bill open, thrust the stone down its throat as far as, as far as my finger could reach. The bird gave a gulp. I felt the stone pass along its gullet down into its crop. But the creature flapped and struggled and out came my sister to know what the matter was. As I turned to speak to her, the brute broke loose and fluttered off amongst the others. Whatever you doing with that bird, Jem, she says. Well, says I, you said you'd give me one for Christmas. I, I was just feeling which was the fattest. <laughs> Oh, she says, well, we set yours aside for you. Jim's bird, we call it. There's a big white one over yonder. There's 26 of them, which makes one for you, one for us, two dozen for the market. Thank you, Maggie, says I, but if it's all the same to you, I'd rather have the one I was handling just now. Well, the other's a good three pounds heavier, said she, and we found it expressly for you. Well, never mind, I said, oh, I'll have the other one, uh, and I'll take it now, said I. No, oh, just as you like, said she, a little huffed. Which is it you want, then? Well, the, the, the white one with the bar tail, right, right in the middle of the flock. Oh, very well, kill it and take it with you. Well, I did what she said, Mr. Mr. Holmes, and, and I carried the bird all the way to Kilburn. I told my pal what I'd done, for he was a man, it was easy to tell a thing like that too. He laughed until he choked. 
We got a knife and opened the goose. My heart turned to water, but there was no sign of the stone, and I knew some terrible mistake had occurred. I left the bird, rushed back to my sisters, and hurried into the backyard. There was not a bird to be seen. Well, where are they all, Maggie? I cried. Gone to dealers, Jem. I wish dealers. Breckenridge in Covent Garden. But, 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 but was there another one with a barred tail, I asked, same as the one I, I chose? Yes, Jim. There were two barred tails, one, and, and I could never tell them apart. Well, then, of course, I saw it all then, and I, I ran off as hard as I could, and my feet would carry me to this man Breckenridge. But he sold a lot, and, and not one word would he tell me as to where they're gone. You, 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 you heard him yourselves tonight. Indeed. Yeah. Well, he's always answered me like that. My, my sister thinks I'm going mad. Sometimes I think I am myself. And now, and now I am myself a branded thief without having touched the wealth for which I sold my character. God help me. God help me. He burst in into convulsive sobbing with his face buried in his hands. There was a long silence, broken only by his heavy breathing, by the measured tapping of Sherlock Holmes's fingertips upon the edge of the table. Then my friend rose and threw open the door. Get out. What, sir? Oh, 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 heaven bless no you. No more words. Get out. And no more words were needed. There was a rush, a clatter upon the stairs, a bang of a door, and a crisp rattle of running footfalls from the street. After all, Watson, said Holmes, reaching for his, ha his hand up for his clay pipe. I am not retained by the police to supply their deficiencies. If Horner were in danger, it would be just another thing, but this fellow will not appear against it, and the case must collapse. I suppose that I am commuting a felony, but it is just possible I am saving a soul. This fellow will not go wrong again. He's too terribly frightened. Send him to jail now, and you make him a jailbird for life. Yeah. Besides, it is the season of forgiveness. Chance has put in our way a most singular and whimsical problem, and its solution is its own reward. Now, if you have the goodness to touch the bell, Doctor, we'll begin another investigation in which, also, a bird will be the chief feature. <laughs> the end. Thank you.